And as Louisa said, I'm absolutely passionate about uh, dizziness and caring for the dizzy patient. I have a number of interest in dizziness. I did my PhD in balance and gait and fall risk um, and using low-tech um, fall prevention strategies to actually reduce the risk of fall. So I've just finished that. So I'm very pleased to have it over. So let's just plunge in. I'm going to talk about a low-tech approach to dizziness. And you need one piece of specialized equipment which will pay for itself over and over and over again and you can get i'm going to talk about it a little bit later and it really is something that every single dizzy clinic should have it makes a huge difference and i've just seen a little girl post covid and using the friends lenses actually ended up with us diagnosing an optic neuritis as well as a vestibular neuritis so it's an essential piece of kit, so just make a little note about that as well. So let us get going. Right, okay. So the ENT examination, obviously you know a lot more about that. Uh, I'm an audiologist, I'll put my own personal bias right out there to start off with. Um, the first thing is I'd encourage you to use a kind of standardized examination sheet, which ensures that you do the same thing with every single patient and also that you actually don't sort of omit vital things. So we have a sheet which I'm very happy to share with you that looks and also makes note taking much quicker and more comprehensive. So a standardized examination, do the same thing in everybody every time. And there are certain key parts of the examination that I'm going to be highlighting. Um, that you absolutely have to do on everybody that I think are essential. Um, we always check the cranial nerves. Um, and I think one of the key things, particularly if you have uh, older adults, is to do the blood pressure in supine and then standing. I can't tell you how common postural hypertension is. And it's one of the things that's so easy and quick to identify and rule out that might be actually adding to causes of dizziness. So we do that in everybody, really important. As I said, I'm an audiologist by training. So I think every dizzy patient must have an audiogram. And there's significant literature to support this opinion as well in that you get the most bang for your buck. It's the highest yield. Uh, of any of the special investigation. And MRI is very seldom gonna do anything to change the course of management, an audiogram will. So I would really, really encourage that if you think there is something vestibular going on, that you actually invest in that audiogram. It's well worth it. The next thing is just a little thought about medication. You need to know what medication they're on. Bearing in mind that some medications can actually induce ocular issues that you need to be aware of. And of course, if the patient's chock full of vestibular sedatives, it could be uh, muting down a response that you would otherwise normally see. So knowing the medication status, particularly looking out for tranquilizers, drugs, vestibular sedatives is really, really important. Okay, so first thing you're going to do, obviously, is examine the patient for spontaneous nystagmus. Now, there's quite a bit of debate uh, about um, sort of what is significant spontaneous nystagmus. First of all, just to remind you of the definition, the definition is that it's there without you having to do anything to the patient. In other words, it's present in room light with the patient's eyes um, fixated. And I want again to appeal to you, it's very frustrating when we come to see patients months after the initial incident, when the registrar's just written nystagmus noted, well, gee, that doesn't tell me a whole lot. So tell me what grade it is, what direction it's in. Really important to remember if it's peripheral vestibular nystagmus, it must follow Alexander's law. Really, really important to remember also to test it in all positions. So you want to do the midline. Uh, you'll often see it incorrectly done on YouTube with a finger like that. I prefer it like that with the patient looking at a much more targeted spot, the midline, and remember just 20 degrees to the left and right, which is much less than you think it is, because you don't want endpoint nystagmus creeping in. So just a little bit to the side, 
And remember to check for vertical upward or downward beating nystagmus as well, really important, okay? And of course, remember it's named after the direction of the quick component, which makes absolutely no physiological sense, but it's purely an arbitrary thing. Now, here's the one piece of kit that you absolutely have to have. Frenzel lenses, really, really important. Why are they important? Because it allows you to examine the patient with the cerebellar influence removed. So in other words, this is when you are most likely to see a peripheral vestibular nystagmus because the cerebellum is trying to damp it down all the time. So if you see the patient after the first three days of an acute vestibular insult, you're not going to see nystagmus just in room light. You have to be able to abolish fixation. Here, the patient on your left, uh, and all the patients, by the way, have consented um, for me to use their images. He's modeling a pair of Frenzel lenses that you can buy from a company in Johannesburg, and they cost about two and a half thousand rand. So in terms of medical equipment, it really isn't a major outlay. But as I say, the bang for your buck that you get out of this is absolutely worth it and it will pay you back again and again. Ones on the right hand side, those are um, nice because they actually are illuminated so you can see better if the light isn't so great in the room. Those are nice, you can also get cordless ones. And of course the Rolls Royce, if you've got lots of funds, is to have video friends or goggles. Those are really nice because that allows you to make a permanent record which might be important, for instance, from a medical legal point of view. If you're treating a patient with BPPV and there's litigation in the background, you want to be able to do a Dick's Hall pack with friends lenses, give the treatment, and then repeat it to show that the nystagmus is settled. So it really is a very nice piece of kit. Okay, so as I've already mentioned, you need to be able to remove the patient's ability to fixate. Now, if you've got nothing at all, you can use a Gansfeld field, which is like a white sheet on a wall. It's really not ideal, but it's probably better than absolutely nothing. But ideally, as I say, you need Frenzel lenses. Just to remind you again, you've got to check the medication. So stimulants and suppressants. And if you see spontaneous nystagmus, if it's peripheral, your patient had better be feeling dizzy. So your first question is, are you feeling dizzy right now? And if the answer is no, and you've got spontaneous nystagmus, then you need to be thinking about ocular causes, medication inducing it, or something like that. Okay, as I mentioned, there's a debate as to what's clinically significant. And as uh, you know, I work with ENTs and really enjoy working with ENTs and firmly believe that team approach is the best way to manage dizzy patients. And I'm really privileged uh, to work in a fantastic um, interdisciplinary team. Um, and, you know, I get teased about, oh, it's audiologist nystagmus rather than ENT nystagmus. I think a lot of ENTs like seeing the nystagmus across the room. Generally, if you are experienced, you can see nystagmus with a velocity of about six degrees per second. And I think the confusion comes in when you start getting sophisticated VNG and it picks up minute quantities of nystagmus. Yeah, it's there, but it may not be significant. So generally, if you can see it, Remember also to check for dissociation between the eyes. The little girl with COVID I told you about a few moments ago, it was only when I put the frenzel lenses on and she had virgins every single, every single time I put them on and otherwise we would have missed it. We were thinking about vestibular migraine, we were thinking about all sorts of things, but those frenzel lenses made a direct difference to her management. So really important. Okay. So remember also that it depends where you work as to how much uh, spontaneous nystagmus you're going to see. If you work in an emergency type setting and get yanked down to the emergency unit for every dizzy patient admission, you're going to see a lot of it. If you work like I do, often patients, I tend to work in a sort of consultant sort of capacity, and I might see patients two or three years after the initial insults. So I don't see a lot of spontaneous nystagmus. And remember, First three days, it might easily be going in one direction, depending on whether it's an irritative or a degenerative lesion. And then the direction of it can actually change in the recovery phase. So just be aware of that. And if it's a peripheral lesion, it's got to be suppressed by fixation. So this whole issue 
of central suppressors peripheral is a key factor in terms of understanding the physiology of eye movement linked to vestibular disturbance. So very, very important. And as I say, if you've got it spontaneously with eyes open, patient had better be feeling vertiginous. Okay, so just thinking about central vestibular nystagmus, you don't often see it, but you can see it. Again, depending where you work, you might see patients with things like multiple sclerosis, things like that. They all end up with eye abnormalities. So prominent vertical uh, component, and this does not behave in a way of peripheral uh, nystagmus. So it doesn't follow Alexander's law. It's not impacted by fixation. So the magnitude is often the same with uh, frenzel lenses or not. And if you see that, you're going to be expecting to see other ocular motor issues as well. So remember, if you've got a central form of vestibular nystagmus, it's coming from a different generator site. So it's going to be accompanied by more neurological kind of symptoms, and you're going to be a lot less vertiginous, so that you might easily have a, quite a marked nystagmus, but patient's not going to be feeling symptomatic. Okay, so I just thought I'd show you, I've got some videos, I just thought I'd show you a nice downbeating nystagmus, really prominent downbeating nystagmus there, very, very easy to see. And of course, this is done with video goggles, which is why you're seeing the infrared. Patient's not able to fix it. Really, really quite marked there. Okay, so remember, as I've mentioned already, that if you see my diagnosis going to the right, for instance, it doesn't mean that the lesion is necessarily on the left. It depends on the recovery nystagmus and the state of compensation. And we like to train in terms of using the evidence base. So we always talk about the predictive value, the sensitivity, the specificity of the tests that we use. Really important when you're doing a clinical battery of tests where combining them all together is much more powerful than using one in isolation. Sensitivity really, really low, about 20%, but look, the specificity is actually fairly high. So just sort of be mindful of that. It's so dependent on the time course between when you are examining the patient and the onset of the lesion. Okay, gaze nystagmus, and I find this is a huge source of confusion. Gaze nystagmus, remember I said to you spontaneous nystagmus means it's there without you doing anything to the patient. Gaze nystagmus, you're doing something to the patient. So gaze nystagmus is the patient is assuming what we call a position of eccentric gaze. In other words, look here, look there. And if you induce nystagmus by moving the gaze away from the midline, then the patient has gaze nystagmus. That is suggesting that you have a lesion in the paramedian nuclei in the brainstem. So gaze nystagmus is always a central kind of finding and you would expect to see other ocular motor fallout as well. So things like smooth pursuit and uh, volitional saccades tracking are going to be abnormal as well. So remember gaze nystagmus is always a central finding and that you're going to start reaching for the forms for uh, referrals. The patient has to be able to see the target, so there's no need to use frenzels for this. Again, remember, most gaze nystagmus is going to be in the vertical plane, and also the role of medication as well. So I've got a textbook that thick on my bookshelf at work, purely discussing ocular um, drug effects, okay? So there's a huge amount of drugs that can produce abnormal ocular movement. Okay, so that's the examination for spontaneous and gaze nystagmus. That's where you're going to start. That already will help you rule certain things in and out in terms of your site of lesion. Now I'm going to talk about the ocular motor tests. And these ocular motor tests are tests, again, looking at the ocular motor function, which is driven by brainstem, uh, brainstem structures. And the first test we do is volitional saccades. Now, when I talk about VOR, I'm going to talk about saccades in terms of head thrust uh, testing. But here, what we're looking at is the ability of the patient to track on your command between your fingers. So look left, look at my nose, look left again, look right. What are you looking for? 
his ocular dysmetria, and afterwards, patients either undershooting the target and having to make a little catch up the card to get it, or otherwise, they over actually hit it accurately. Okay, this obviously is done in a much more sophisticated manner via VNG, where we can actually look with precision at the latency and so on. Um, but what you do, it's always a finding suggestive of brainstem or cerebellar lesion. So it's always a good test to do. Even if you have a peripheral vestibular nystagmus, uh, the ability to drive saccades like this is not affected. So it should be normal in peripheral vestibular lesions. Smooth pursuit. Now we always do smooth pursuit. So lock onto the target, follow nice and smooth way to do it. So a smooth, slowly and predictably moving target like that. And again, easily contaminated by concentration. Older adults have difficulty doing this and medication is a major body. Field trip to um, go now and what? So just remember, it's very, very easily contaminated. It's the weakest, I think, of the test because it's 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 really lacking in sensitivity and specificity. So if only the smooth pursuit is abnormal, I wouldn't get too worked up about it. If the other ocular motor tests are abnormal as well, then you've got my attention. Okay, here's an example of smooth pursuit, very abnormal smooth pursuit. And you can see this is a really nice video because you've got the cursor at the bottom actually tracking that eye movement. And you can see there's a lot of saccadic intrusion in this. So the patient is vaguely sort of tracking the target, but there's an awful lot of saccadic overlay. So this patient needs a referral because there's likely a neurological lesion here. Right, okay, so I'm moving on reasonably quickly because I want to allow plenty of time for questions and I'm also assuming that you know the physiological basis for these main tests here are head thrust, also known as head impulse testing, the head shake test and dynamic visual acuity. And just a reminder to myself, training matters. So particularly for head thrust, technique is everything. You need to be taught by somebody who's really expert at doing it, because if your technique is not right, you're never going to be able to induce a response. And the head thrust particularly needs to be done aggressively. Okay, so head thrust, it's basically a test that is going to pick up in one of its big bilateral lesions. So if you have a vestibular hypofunction on one or both sides, you should be able to pick it up with a head thrust. There's been some very nice work looking at what they call the tri triple test, which is looking at presence of spontaneous nystagmus plus a head thrust plus a bedside caloric. And if you do those three tests, you really are going to pick up a lot um, of unilateral lesions particularly. So again, as I say, it needs to be done really aggressively. And what you're looking for is a refixation saccade. Because of the deficit in the vestibular ocular reflex gain, the patient needs to make a refixation saccade after rapid head movement because the eye has drifted out of position. Okay, I'm trying to avoid long term why they work. But I want you just to have a look at this and see if you can see which side this patient has. Oh, sorry, it has the lesion. Just go back. Okay, so see if you can see if you can see that rapid eye movement, that corrective saccade. Have a look. Um, 
Um, this is an American video and they do it from a kind of standing start kind of thing. We find patients are often quite resistant. So we actually tend to sort of waggle the head a little bit just to get the patient to release that neck tension and then give the quick one. And just a tip, if you're not particularly expert, it'd be better than driving it from your hands. So it actually needs to be a kind of wrist movement and it needs to be really rapid. If it's not brisk enough, you're just never going to see it. Okay, so have a look at this patient. I think this response is quite a bit more subtle and see which side you think this patient has. Okay, so this patient has got bilateral vestibular hypofunction. She's got bilateral saccades. Okay, so head shake, okay? Head shake tends to be weaker in terms of sensitivity and specificity. It works on this issue of asymmetry going into the velocity storage calculator in the brain, the velocity storage um, in the brain. And as you are moving head towards the leash, moving to the normal side, when the head stops shaking, you get this burst of nystagmus afterwards. Remember, of course, it's got to be done with eyes closed. Very important, because what you're trying to build up is peripheral vestibular nystagmus, which is always at its best in the eyes closed condition. Okay, so head forward, because you want the horizontal semicircular canal in the field of plane. So head forward, shake, 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 eyes closed. About 20 shakes is enough. The second the patient stops shaking, on with the frenzel lenses, and you're going to see a nice big burst of nystagmus if the patient has got a unilateral hypofunction. And you need to be snappy with the frenzel lenses. If you're faffing around and get, don't get them on quickly enough, you might only get five seconds worth, and then you're going to miss it. Okay. As I say, sensitivity, again, not fabulous. Specificity is quite a lot better, but remember it's only going to pick up unilateral lesions. And again, like a lot of what we do, this is best used in a test battery. So I still do head shake, but I want to see, I would be expecting to see an abnormal saccade as well. So here we go. Go ahead and just shake your head side to side real quickly, real quickly, but. 15 times. Patient's got frenzel lenses on, so there's no faffing. Okay, now stop. There you go. Nice burst of nystagmus induced by that head shaking. Okay, so Generally, head shaking with unilateral weakness, as proved by caloric, the test tends to get better as the extent of the lesion. You're going to get a positive head shake test. Um, but if you've only got a very mildly unusual, you see it? So it's nice used in combination with the head thrust test and then a bedside caloric as well. Just wanted to mention dynamic visual acuity. This is a really accessible test. Uh, we prefer doing it with an illegible e-chart because then the patient doesn't have to be literate. In this one, you can see it's more of a Snellen chart and the patient needs to be literate to use it. It can be done seated or standing, for example, in terms of it can be done with the patient even lying in bed. And what you do is the patient reads with best corrected vision, reads down to the bottom line, with the head being either passive or actively moving, and you set a metronome with your cell phone, um, and then the idea is that the patients essentially have retinal slip associated with uh, vestibular hypofunction. And particularly if they have bilateral vestibular hypofunction, 
and they have oscillopsia, that they have this jumbling of the image when the head is moving because they can't stabilize it on the fovea. The patient needs the image of the ototype to be much bigger uh, when the head is moving versus with the head stationary. So I thought I'd just mention it. It actually is quite a nice um, test. And you know you can buy um, or download an eye chart easily enough off the internet. So again, very, very low tech. And it's sensitive to in terms of bilateral lesions. So that is quite a nice test. So I would encourage you to use this, particularly if you're in a resource constrained setting. You can also get a, a computerized version. You can buy a, one which you can download off the internet for about $95. Um, so just to let you know that that is possible as well. Right, okay, my favorite. Okay, so hyperventilation. I hyperventilate absolutely every patient, and there are two reasons for this. One is that we know that there's a huge comorbidity of anxiety with vestibular lesions, and it really is an incredibly common fellow traveler. As I mentioned, I often see patients months, even years, after the initial uh, disorder. And that gives plenty of time to develop. So functional breathing disorders, which is what we're calling them now, according to the new evidence-based guidelines, are very common. The second thing is that the mechanism of a hyperventilation test can actually release a notion of the nerve. So it could be that it's the poor man's MRI. And the special instruction is, this is why I like it particularly as well, special instruction is when you feel dizzy, I want you to just raise your hand and show me that you're feeling dizzy, but I don't want you to stop breathing until I tell you to. And uh, one of uh, our research projects that we did uh, at UCT was looking at the hyperventilation questionnaire, which again is freely available over the internet, um, and looking at our clinical hyperventilation test with the special instruction. And if they got dizzy within, with less than 30 seconds, there was a, quite a high correlation with high scores on the questionnaire and also with the presence of anxiety and depression and even panic. And that just leads me to remind you that you can actually induce a panic attack uh, in patients when you're hyperventilating them. The other reason I like this is that it gives you a really nice in to talk about the role of anxiety with vestibular disorder. You remember how you felt during that test? Okay, now this is actually what's happening. So you can give a physiological explanation for why they are feeling the way they are feeling. And as I say, a lot of our patients are walking around subclinically hyperventilating in any case. How you do it? Eyes closed, of course, because you're hoping to induce a peripheral vestibular nystagmus. Patient hyperventilates for 60 seconds, and then you look with frenzel lenses. Okay, the Americans do it standing with your hand on their shoulder. I must say, I don't. I do it with the patient seated uh, because they feel more secure. Um, and remember to check for signs with frenzel lenses. And this is why you do it on everybody. Here we go. The sound does kick in later in the video, so just bear with us. So this is the patient's spontaneous nystagmus, obviously with infrared uh, video goggles. And the patient's going to be instructed to hyperventilate just now. So I want you to be thinking about Brun's nystagmus, which is very common with vestibular schwannoma. Here we go. You often have to reinforce the patients. Um, they start feeling very symptomatic very quickly often. So you have to kind of coax them. So you're actually washing carbon dioxide out, making the blood more alkaline, and releasing the inhibition on the eighth nerve. 
There you go. So you can see how it's accelerated, markedly accelerated that nystagmus. So this is why you do hyperventilation in every single patient, as well as an audiogram. Really nice, really nice video there. And I, I think this one really does tell a thousand words. Massive irritation of that spontaneous nystagmus. Huge. Okay. Thought I'd just mention the Romberg test because we still have this undying belief that the Romberg test has got something to do with vestibular function. It's got absolutely nothing to do with vestibular function. It's reliant on the patient's uh, cerebellar control and proprioceptive input. The reason we still do it is it's really nice if you're wondering about a functional component where the patients tend to either fall um, into your arms, no matter which diet, where you are standing, or otherwise you get inconsistencies where the patients are all over the place in the eyes open condition. And then in the eyes closed or sharpened condition, their control's a lot better. We also like doing it with distractions. So the patient, we like the Jurassic maneuver, the Jane Jurassic maneuver, where the patient holds their hands like that on their chest. And then you can say, okay, now put your finger on your nose. And if the control improves when they're distracted, then it is suggesting a sort of functional overlay. And also it helps you demonstrate to the patient that their vestibular system's not broken. Okay, Re really nice. I'm just going to skip that, just be mindful of time. Modified catsip, you need a foam cushion for this. Again, very, very cheap, about 200 um, rand. Um, and for those of you that might be interested, I'm actually working with a, a rehab um, company at the moment, putting a vestibular rehab kit together at very low cost, where you could hopefully in the future be able to buy all of this equipment as a sort of one-stop shop, as well as, as have um, access to rehab uh, therapy um, input. So it's essentially starts, as you can see from top left um, and bottom left, it's essentially a standard Romberg, and then the patient does it eyes open and closed on foam. 30 seconds, the reason I've got this here, is that there are age and sex matched norms, and it can be used to predict not thinking about that much when we're in a vestibular clinic, but it is an important issue uh, medico-legally and from patients' health um, and emotional wellness point of view. Just uh, it used to be incredibly popular. We still do it, but again, it's one of these tests that is better if the patient has more <clears throat> marked um, unilateral weakness and you never ever do it on a patient if they have spontaneous nystagmus because they are going to fall. So they're going to take about 50 steps marching in place, eyes closed, and then they may rotate. I say usually towards the side of lesion, but you absolutely can't say for sure, sure, you know, because they went to the left, that's, that's where they have it. Okay, I'll spare you. Attention, retropulsion is something more that you would see in a neurology clinic. What are you thinking about? The patient stands with feet slightly apart and keep their balance, taking a step if necessary. If the patient takes three or more steps back or falls without taking a step, then the test is positive. This can show central involvement, such as basal ganglia disorders. Okay, so just a thought about that. Um, the other thing that I think you should have in your clinic, a luggage strap that you put around your suitcase when you are traveling. So it literally has a, like either a clip a buckle like an airline um, a airline safety belt or otherwise one of those squeezy ones that you have on a luggage belt it is much easier and better to manage patients postural control using a gait belt that you grab if they look like they're going to fall than sort of clutching at clothing so i would encourage uh, you to buy a gait belt again they are very inexpensive and just from a medical legal risk of falls in your clinic, I would definitely recommend that you always examine patients when you're doing walking and standing tests with a gait belt. Okay, dynamic gait index is something that we often do. It's, we like it as audiologists because we use it as one of our outcome measures. It's responsive to therapeutic change if you're doing vestibular rehab. 
it's a formal quantifiable test. It's free, copyright free. You can just download it off the internet. Needs very, very little training to be able to do it competently. It evaluates fall risk. It can alert you to functional components as well, which is nice. And it just gives you a more global sort of idea of how the patient is managing in daily life. So very, very nice minutes. Um, so it really doesn't add much to the length of your consultation. All of these tests that I've talked about, you can do this test battery in 10 minutes. So where are you going to spend your time? Case history, the first test. Right, Dick's Hall Pack, that's the other one that I do on absolutely everybody, okay? Because you always might have a surprise. And remember, about um, a third of patients with BPPV will not have a typical case history. So just because they're not giving you the classic case history, um, don't assume that they do not have BPPV. Two ways to do it. Uh, a, top and bottom, um, where the patient is hyper end extended off the end of the table is the one that I actually quite like. And it's the one that the most research has been done on in terms of its sensitivity and specificity. B is better if you're in a confined space where the patient is significantly less back strain. And if you've got patients who are obese or anything like that, they can't lie on their back, can be better. But what I want to point out to you is that the head is in the same position in that final position. And that's the key thing. You've got to have the semicircular canal in the plane of test. And remember in Dick's Hall Pack, you're doing anterior and posterior canal, and you've got to have them positioned correctly. Note also that the clinician is positioning the head before the extension. You can't be moving the head as the patient's going down. Position first like that, about 45 degrees slightly upward, and then back, okay? So again, technique is everything. Now, back when the earth was cooling, when I guess, whack them down like a real kind of slam dunk. And if you think about it, that's actually counterintuitive because getting into bed and getting out of bed is going to trigger it. So it's a lot more gentle than it used to be. Okay, sideline test. And as I say, that was the B. Um, and that you certainly can do. Again, it's going to test patients for posterior or anterior canal BPPV. Certainly can be substituted. It's just not as well researched as the classic Dix Hall Pack. But remember, the sensitivity and specificity of both these tests is not ideal because it depends on the dynamics of what's going on in terms of the size of that clot of otoconia the moment that you see them. So if you have a patient that you so know has BPPV and it's negative on the day of test, then bring them back. Right. Horizontal canal. Yeah, remember to do that, particularly if you're pack is negative. Remember also to do this after you've done a Canano 3 positioning procedure. Okay, I'm just going to show you, this is my final slide, a video of a semicircular canal to Hisson's syndrome uh, with tuning forks on the extremities. Here we go. base of my skull is shaking, my neck, I'm trying to stabilize it. Okay. Right, so I was told I had three quarters of an hour, I've made it. Uh, lots of information, but the slides are available to you um, and the slides have also been narrated. So if you download it and you just click on the narration, you will hear the narration. So I am very, very happy to take questions.
Excellent. Thank you so much, Christine. That was really, really uh, right. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Well, that was that was really fantastic. Thank you. That was I don't actually know how you managed to fit all of that into 45 minutes. So you did extremely well. Um, I'm just having a look at the at the chat um, there's some compliments ca coming through saying thank you for the excellent talk um, there was just a question from Ramesh uh, saying asking for the the name of the questionnaire for um, the hyperventilation and for the rehab kits and I see that you've actually already responded okay thanks so much um, we'd like to open yeah. it to the yeah. floor are there any questions that anyone would like to um, chat to Christine about? Anything um, you are welcome to raise your hand and we can try and address those questions quickly. It's a lot of information in three quarters of an hour, but remember the test itself only takes 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. I see there is one question saying, in which patients would you routinely do uh, HITS exam? Right, okay. So the HIMSS uh, tends to be used more in emergency settings when uh, the clinician is trying to decide between is this a stroke or is this a vestibular lesion and the key thing is that the head impulse test is what makes you make that decision okay uh, so generally the hints is sort of embedded in the examination i have described so it's the head impulse test the nice tangent a lot but i mean it's certainly is taught and it certainly is something that we we teach in our courses but essentially it's it's kind of embedded in what we do and as and it does give you a very nice answer and the key there is if your head thrust test is negative then you are more likely to be looking I hope I answered the question. Glycerol test. Oh boy. Okay. Glycerol test is an absolutely hit thing because you can see this isn't my first time round the block. Uh, again, back when the earth was cooling, when I trained, we did do glycerol tests. It's absolutely revolting. Uh, the patient normal saline uh, and then you do sequential audiograms. Uh, generally we diagnose um, it on the it, many disease on the M word because most of our patients have migraine rather than uh, vestibular uh, rather than true many disease. We want to see the hearing loss first and that is in um, uh, in agreement with the very, very nice uh, clinical guidelines that are published in the Journal of Vestibular Research. You always want to see the hearing test first. So I personally would never uh, do a glycerol test. A diuretic, if you wanted to, it's incredibly weak in terms of its sensitivity. And by the way, ECOG is, so if you have sophisticated testing, ECOG is equally weak. Um, at the moment that ECOG should actually be abandoned. Uh, if you've got very uh, sophisticated MRI, there is some talk that you can see high drops on MRI, but I'm not expert um, on that and I haven't done a lot of reading on that. So generally, I would go for the audiogram, I would go for seeing a uni classic history and you having ruled everything else out and particularly your differential there is vestibular migraine and remember migraine is common, Men's disease is actually incredibly rare. Canal is the problem. Uh, thank Dick's you so much. Like positive left, fatigable, so then that yeah go for it go for it sorry there was a bit of delay uh, yeah how thanks. much do you want me to answer about the dix hall pike yes please yes please thanks christine okay so 
Okay, so the Dick's Hall Pack, fatigable position rather than a with repeated positioning. So that would be suggesting a canalolithiasis. Vertigo and torsional nystagmus. Um, was the vertical torsional nystagmus upward or downward beating? That would let you, it's, the, it's whether it's upward or downward beating that helps you um, identify the canal that would be beating. If it is the posterior canal, Beating. And if it is going to the left, on the left, I'm thinking that you would have a posterior canal and I For the diagnosis of Menius disease, very weak in terms of sensitivity and specificity. If any of you um, you know, if I get a pregnancy pregnant patient in, they're going to have a positive test and you're weakness demonstrated on calorics. And at that point, we'll make a diagnosis. Fantastic, Christine. Um, thanks. It just seems there seems to be a little bit of a delay now um, on our internet system. So I hope it's not disturbing us too much. Um, are there any more comments from the floor? Anything, anything else anyone would like to know? Um, we will be putting the slide shows up onto our YouTube channel um, for people that perhaps joined late um, or even for people that might have further questions. Christine is extremely approachable and she's very happy to take email questions as well. Um, she promises to respond as soon as um, as possible yeah. well, she's obviously going to be in high demand after this presentation um so christine's email address um is previously on the slides but i'll also just give it to you if you need it so it's uh christine with a capital c so c-h-r-i-s-t-i-n-e dot rogers without the d so r-o-g-e-r-s that's at u-c-t dot a-c dot z-a um, if you don't remember that, you are welcome to contact um, any one of the UCT registrars, myself, or any one other members of the team, and we can definitely put you into contact with um, Christine, either via email um, or by other means. Um, Christine, we really want to thank you so much for taking the time. It was a really fantastic presentation. Um, I think you're going to get lots of YouTube views after this presentation, especially with all the videos. So we want to really thank you so much. Um, we are basically close to closing. Are there any closing comments from you, Christine? No, absolutely nothing other than uh, I really enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't complete information overload, but I do tend to get very carried away because <laughs> I just absolutely love what I do. No, um, I've, I've just put the name of the company that is selling the Frenzel lenses. It's called Amtronics. They are in Johannesburg. Thanks for the reply. Um, we want to thank everyone for joining the meeting this morning. Yeah. We had an excellent turnout. At one point, we had around 76 people joining, up to 80 people joining. So that's a fantastic turnout. Um, I'm going to start closing the meeting um, now for this morning. So thank you so much again to everyone that attended. Um, look out for the YouTube channel. And uh, Christine, I hope you're ready for uh, lots of questions. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a good morning. <laughs>